Can everyone hear me? All right. Thank you very much for the welcome. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, and I'm so excited to see how many people have come here to, to Blacksburg, to Blocksburg, <laughs> um, and are really interested in changing the world. What I want to talk about today is the bigger picture. Why are we doing blockchain? What, you know, we've talked about lots of different solutions, whether it's voting or stocks or shareholders. But we're doing all this because of uh, a bigger movement, right? I didn't get into this to do blockchain. I found blockchain because I wanted to change the world. I wanted to make the world a better place. You know, I set out with my mission, uh, which I've said over and over again, uh, is to find free market voluntary solutions for securing our life, our liberty, our property, and ensuring justice for everyone. That mission is bigger than blockchain. Blockchain is a tool. It's a very powerful tool. But if we focus on the technology, the blockchain too much, we lose sight of the bigger purpose. And the bigger purpose is what causes us to get up in the morning to pursue these technologies, to fight the fights with the regulators, to uh, struggle with the scaling the technology, getting adoption, uh, these are all things we do for a higher purpose. So let's talk about that higher purpose and, and what I view it as. I view it as increasing the level of integrity in society. Integrity applies to everything from business to government to individual to even our food systems. And when we have integrity, we can grow and we can prosper and we're in alignment with our environment. When we don't have integrity, things start to fall apart. There's opportunities for deception, manipulation, fraud. We lose trust in each other, and we spend more time protecting ourselves from each other than working together to make the world a better place. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to open this up for questions here in a little bit. But before I do, I want you to think about all the different ways that we can improve integrity in our society and think about why we are doing things because that's more important than any individual solution. There are other ways to do currencies that don't rely on blockchain but still have integrity. So let's not get lost in the weeds. Blockchain's amazing. What I like about blockchain is it allows us to make society more efficient. How many of you have bought a house? All right. You've seen all those papers you've signed? <laughs> you have no idea what's in it? You, you have to buy uh, uh, insur title insurance, right? How many bought title insurance? All right. How many have had a problem with your title insurance and then couldn't get any collection on it? All right. <laughs> the, the point is, you, you sign a contract. And there's pages upon pages, and you sign the last page. And the last page is nothing more than a signature page. Well, you could be signing anything. They could just copy that last page and put whatever text they want. All right, we've gotten into a society that's so far removed from uh, the concept of integrity that we no longer, our contracts are beyond our comprehension. You're agreeing to stuff you don't know what you're agreeing to. Uh, and there's no proof of agreement. We've got laws that are so Byzantine no one can even possibly know them all, yet you're accountable, right? They say ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Why well, challenge anyone in Congress to recite the laws of this country? Um, so one of the strategies that blockchain is built on for, to, for increase in integrity is decentralization. Now, that's a word that uh, I hate and I love because it's not defined well. But the spirit of decentralization is to put control down into the hands of more people, to have more variety, less monoculture. Right? If you look at centralization, you, we have an election, and we elect one president to decide for 320 million people. 
that's, a very that's a very centralized decision-making process. One blockchain, well, that's centralized in and of itself, regardless of the consensus algorithm you use. The blockchain has to decide which is the one true chain. So decentralization is about having many, many options, lots of variety, and not making everything the same. You know, in, in, in nature, there's lots of variety. And when there's not lots of variety, things are subject to disease, rot, decay. Uh, it's just not sustainable. It might appear to be more efficient in the short term, but it's a lot more fragile in the long term. We need competition and cooperation. We need respect for each other uh, to try different things and do things different ways, rather than trying to get everyone to adopt one way of doing things. And so blockchain technology allows smaller groups of people to form this community or that community. Uh, and we need to uh, have many different communities and not compete and say, oh, my community has to grow and so some other community needs to shrink. So that's what's going on in the cryptocurrency world. It's Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus EOS, right? And everyone's fighting over, you know, are you decentralized? Are you decentralized? The reality is collectively we are all decentralized by providing more options for people so that if one blockchain gets corrupted because all the miners happen to be in China, well, then there's another option run by different people. And if one governance system uh, gets corrupted by having strong stakeholders that come uh, to get control, then there's other alternatives that people can move to. Imagine you only had one, one store where you could buy your food. Are you free? Or do you have to do whatever they say if you don't want to starve? Freedom is about having choices and making sure there's lots of them. In order to make sure you have choices, you have to make sure nothing gets too big. <clears throat> when things get big, they get centralized, they get inefficient, and then they fail all at once. If you look at the structure of our body, lots of individual cells. Each cell is centralized in itself but they collaborate. And that, that design pattern scales throughout nature. Humanity is a bunch of individual humans. Uh, so that if some of us fail, others can succeed. We need to allow failure uh, of some people so that others can learn from those experiences. And that is the spirit of decentralization, is to have lots of competition, lots of variety, so that some can succeed, some can fail, and then you can have the, the principles of nature can express themselves through our technology, through our organization. Now, technology is kind of anti-nature. We tend to make things rigid, straight lines, make everything conform into one size fits all. Uh, but decentralization uh, means lots of variety. So, you know, with blockchain, we're trying to make it more scalable. We want to make the technology cheaper so that more people can be in smaller communities can get the benefit. So whether every company should have its own blockchain, uh, and we see this now, but really, every company is going to have many different blockchains. Uh, you don't see people arguing for uh, one particular technology. I, everything should be C-sharp. How many people think everything should be C-sharp and we should have no C++, no Java? Right? That just doesn't make sense. We have a variety of languages. Each one serves its purpose. We have a variety of blockchains. Uh, so you know, what I'm doing at block one is building the technology, making it more accessible, more easier to use so that more people can experiment, so that people here can pick it up and start building things more efficiently, faster, and have uh, uh, just more variety. You've, you've heard a lot of the potential ideas here the past two days of things people are working on. But the reality is, if anywhere two or more people need to collaborate, you need a blockchain. You need a way of, of keeping track of who agreed to what, where. You need social networks that prove identity, 
build those relationships uh, that don't rely on centralized identity providers, right? Governments control your ID. They, they say who you are. But what we really want in society is a mesh of identity where you are who you are because your friends are, and they are who they are because of their friends. And that will uniquely identify every individual person. And that provides more security. Like we're using these technologies, private keys, uh, on hardware devices. It really protects your identity. And when your identity is strong, then we can do transparent elections. And transparent elections are uh, an interesting thing. Like Adam was, was talking about follow my vote. I've worked with him for a long time, funded his, his business early on. Uh, the idea of having integrity in our elections is is fundamental, because if we can't have integrity in our elections and some other thing has priority, like there's thinking, well, what about coercion? What about this? Uh, we, we should first err on the side of integrity, which means you can prove who you voted for. You can prove um, that the vote was counted and that everyone who is participating is a real person. That is the first level of integrity. And when we compromise our integrity because of concerns about privacy, and, and we design a system where it's actually impossible to prove that the election was honest. I don't care which voting machine system you use, paper ballots, why not? It's not who votes that counts, it's who counts the votes. And if you can't count the votes, and you can't verify that everyone's a valid voter, uh, and you can't write the software you're using to count the votes, and you have to rely on someone else, you've compromised the integrity of the system. But we live in a society where people uh, are trained in the conception that it has to be a secret and it can't know, and therefore we're enforcing, and it's actually against the law in many places, to have a, system, a voting system that has integrity to it. So what I'm getting back here with these examples is that if we lose the, the focus of integrity, you can build systems without integrity on a blockchain. Blockchain will make sure everyone said they uh, sign what they said and the order in which they said it, and you can all agree on the common outcome. But it has to be, it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. So that's why it's important to think about the higher picture. Blockchain is a tool that, uh, that gives us the possibility to create structures and communities and organizations where the level of integrity is higher uh, than it's ever been before where the cost of achieving it is lower, where the opportunities for fraud and deception are minimized. Now, when you go to buy a company, you have to do your due diligence. How do you know you've got every uh, contract that company has ever signed and all the terms it's ever agreed to? You can't do that today. You hire attorneys to sift through all kinds of documents, and then you ask the sellers to make representations and warranties that they've disclosed everything to you, um, but it's not actually possible to know you have everything. Blockchain makes those things possible and allows you to accelerate it. You know, blockchain makes it easier to get into the capital markets and to have new ways of providing incentives, uh, accounting for people's contributions to society, whether it's donations to your church uh, or it's... Um, anything else you want to track. Uh, you, you, know, you use QuickBooks and you do your accounting. You want to minimize the fraud. You want to automate your taxes. How many people would like your taxes to be automated and not have to deal with the IRS anymore? OK. You know, how many people don't want to have your deposits uh, at your bank go disappear because the, the bank violates some rules and they don't know? No one goes to jail, but you lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? We, can't, we shouldn't be having that in society, not in our day and age. And, you know, in theory, if we had more integrity, these types of things wouldn't happen. And if we built that into our culture, we wouldn't need blockchain as much. But blockchain allows us to commit to integrity with intention rather than just hoping that it exists. And that's why every bank, every government, when you're doing buying and selling land, uh, every contract you sign, uh, you know, when you get married, uh, the keys to your car, all these things need to be, can be tracked and dealt with 
much more efficiently. Uh, and you eliminate a lot of the work that's currently placed on regulators to try to enforce integrity from the outside. So when businesses have to make the decision of do I build on blockchain or do I not, the real question is, do I want to build a system with integrity by design or do I want to build a system where I compromise integrity for the sake of uh, you know, efficiency? Uh, although I think blockchain can become just as efficient as the other solutions. Um, or because, hey, I actually like the ability to backdate things and change things after the fact. And uh, I like the flexibility it gives me to not actually commit to, to things and go back on things. Or I like to pay lawyers lots of money to uh, fight over the vague terms they throw in contracts no one can understand. All right, there's, when you build your business on blockchain, you're telling the world you're committed to integrity, you're telling your customers you're committed to it, you're telling your employees you're committed to it, and that makes all the difference in the final outcome. Because uh, if your heart's not in it for the right reasons, then you might have a blockchain, but you're not going to stop the corruption. Uh, and so that's my high-level view uh, of where I think all this goes. It's a reminder of why we got here in the first place, because we're tired of the rich getting richer because they're leveraging systems and that are biased towards centralized powers, centralized decision making. We're tired of one size fits all solutions, uh, whether it's for healthcare or food inspections or uh, you know whatever your house permitting rules are, right? We have a society that's increasingly one size fits all, uh, but then we don't have integrity in the institutions that are running these things. Uh, and we, we keep thinking bigger government, bigger organizations will solve all the corruption, but all they do today is create more power, more concentrated, more corruption. Uh, and that's why we decentralize. That's why we put it, build integrity in at the very foundation. We need to demand it from all of our institutions, whether it's our universities, whether it's our DMV. We need to be demanding it, and we need to be demanding it from the companies we do business with. So that's my uh, soapbox for the moment. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Any question, I love questions about how blockchain works, how blockchain can be used in your business, about the future of ESIO. Uh, anything you'd like to ask, uh, I'm game. Yes, Ted. All right, so the question was about smart contracts, how they can aid in buying homes. One of the most challenging things when you're buying a home is just having proof that the person who owns the house currently has the right to sell you the home, that the land is properly surveyed, that you got the right title insurance, uh, that the loan for the home is paid off and the, the lender, uh, the previous uh, buyer is there, that the new lender knows that you've got all the insurance. So blockchains can make it trivial to know who owns the house. It can make it trivial to know how much debt's on the house, to know that it's been paid off. And the smart contract can simultaneously and atomically switch ownership and satisfy all the constraints. So um, you know, it could completely eliminate the need for title insurance. Once everything is on, on the blockchain, if it's, if it's on the blockchain, it's good. If it's not, then uh, you know, it doesn't exist. So all your rights away, all the uh, other agreements, whether it's um, driveway maintenance agreements or whatever it might be, uh, it's all documented on the blockchain. And there is just one source of truth. And that provides great efficiency for the real estate market. Uh, and it can even make things like real estate investment trusts uh, much more automated. You can remove a lot of the overhead, remove a lot of the trust, 
blockchain and tokenization kind of make investing in individual houses uh, and rather than debt financing houses, equity finance your house, <laughs> right? We've got a, our culture where the banks don't have any skin in the game. You know, if the house prices go up or down, they get their money no matter what. But if we switch to a culture where, you know, I think the, uh, the Muslim culture is kind of, they, they don't allow interest, so they have to uh, structure things a little bit differently. There's lots of opportunities to invest in new, to create new incentive models to make, uh, to prevent bubbles and to align interest between the owner of the house, be a fractional owner in your house, and you just buy your house over time. Um, and so there's lots of really cool things that can be done in the real estate market. The geo blockchain. Okay. I don't know much. I can't answer the question about the status of this particular blockchain, but I do think combining blockchain and GIS systems is a great application. Uh, it speaks to, you know, how do you el eliminate the need to constantly redo the surveys of everything and and uh, and simplify title insurance. Hi. Uh, when do you think we'll see uh, Voice get launched? <laughs> when will Voice get launched? Soon. <laughs> uh, that, that's a trademark term. Um, the team is laughing. <laughs> 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 uh, la launching Voice is you know, got many problems we need to solve. Everything from the technology to the legal, right? And so not everything is within our time frame. I can tell you we've got amazing code ready to go. We've got uh, amazing progress with the regulators. Um, and it was very encouraging to, to see the stance of at least one SEC commissioner uh, from yesterday. That was very good um, for the future of voice. Uh, we're very excited, and I'd love to share with you more. Like Brendan says, we're, you know, if we promise if we don't tell you anything, everyone's wondering, what are we doing? If we tell you, like, when's it coming? It's coming as fast as we can bring it to you. Uh, no one's more excited to get it out of the market as quickly as possible than we are. Hi. Uh, how do you think of the divergence between academia and, and industry? Because I think the, the academia focuses more on decentralization, but the uh, industry focuses more on efficiency and scalability. So how do you think, think of that? Uh, the great debate, efficiency versus scalability versus decentralization. So I'd like to address that because I think it's actually uh, a major source of debate in the industry. People uh, form their different tribes. They have their different beliefs. You know, proof of work is the one only truly decentralized way, or delegated proof of stake means you know, 15 people who all happen to be Chinese uh, is completely centralized. And, uh, you know, so there's this huge debate, what is, what is decentralized? Uh, the truth is that you could take EOSIO and you could use the proof of work consensus algorithm with EOSIO and still process thousands of transactions per second. The belief that delegated proof of stake is the source of the performance of EOSIO is, uh, um, it's, it's possibly my fault, but possibly it's other, other people not understanding. Delegated proof of stake provides a way to uh, reduce the latency, but has nothing to do with throughput. So you can have 15 second blocks processing thousands of transactions per second using proof of work and have a, much of the same developer experience that you have with ESIO. So while proof of work doesn't necessarily, does have a performance impact on the latency of your transaction confirmation, it's got no impact on the throughput. Um, now, decentral, could you restate your question? Because I want to make sure I get it fully answered. Yes, I, I was asking about the divergence between academia and, yeah. OK, yeah. So um, efficiency is all about reducing costs uh, and scalability. These are things that are necessary to operate things like voice as a social media platform. 
right? If, if you're going to have tens of millions of users interacting on a blockchain, uh, you, got, you want low latency so you can preserve the user experience. The reality is most people are extremely spoiled by the expectations of how fast things operate today on the internet. We can't go backwards. We have to bring the technology of blockchain to the same performance capabilities of what we have without blockchain solutions, but then add the integrity, add the security, add the auditability, uh, accountability uh, to it. So you could say that if it's a public blockchain, as in anyone can fork the chain and go in a different direction, everyone can see the entire ledger, it's decentralized. That's my definition of decentralized because there's no vendor lock-in. If you don't like the current block producers or the current mining pools, fork it, go a different way. If the majority of the community agrees, then that's going to be the new official chain. So that is my key definition of decentralized. Is it public? Does that, does, uh, is there vendor lock-in? Right? Does the person who controls it, do they have permanent control of it? Or does the community of all the users have the ability to say, you know what, we don't like this dictator, put a new dictator in? Uh, or forget dictatorship, we're going to have an election. Or forget that, we're going to go to proof of work. Right? You can swap the consensus algorithm uh, if you get enough buy-in from the community as long as, there's not, um, as long as it's public and everyone can see it. Now, currency makes forking very easy. Right? Oh, we got Bitcoin, I got Bitcoin Cash, and I got 20 different forks of Bitcoin. And each community says, oh, we're going to use this currency for us, and they all have different market caps, and it's all nice and clean. But when you have a blockchain that's selling movie tickets, and the movie ticket's on the blockchain, if that chain forks, well, you don't all of a sudden have twice as many seats in your theater. That's a, a real problem. Uh, and that's where some of the lock-in comes. But that's largely solved by having every single business have its own blockchain. Right? Every business can go its own way. And then to have lots of competition between businesses. If you don't like this movie theater's policies, you go use some other movie theater. Right? If uh, Oracle's not doing the database work you need, go to MySQL, go to Mongo. There are different alternatives in terms of how you can structure the governance of your chain to achieve decentralization. Um, now, I like to talk about academia. and and the research side of things. Because the blockchain industry as a whole has spawned a ton of research into advanced cryptographic techniques, zero knowledge proofs, and uh, new ways to do trustless things. And they're all extremely computationally intensive. Right? They're not really practical for today's uh, business environment. But that's good. The stuff where you, blockchain's built on today, elliptic curves and things like that, were not really practical 30 years ago. Computers weren't fast enough yet. So we're, blockchain's spawning the, the future technology. Uh, but in the short term, uh, we need to design things with ease of use in mind. If you build a system, it doesn't matter how fast the car can go if no one can drive it. <laughs> uh, if we need to make things easy to use. And ease of use is actually a critical component of security. If people can't figure out how to use it, they're going to find ways around it. They're going to put a post-it note with their password on it. Right? So we can't just say it's more secure theoretically. It has to be more secure practically. And practically, that means um, making it easier to use. The other thing to consider is which society would you rather live in? The society where everyone's got bars on the windows and security checkpoints and uh, uh, TSA lines at every store that you go into, or a society where there aren't, aren't locks on the doors, right? You can just trust everyone. Security systems and solutions are there to keep honest people honest. And we should focus on increasing the integrity of the individuals in society, because that actually creates the environment we want to live in. We don't want to live in an environment where uh, <laughs> You have to work really, really hard to protect your security, protect your identity, uh, and to use systems and you know, enter 20 character passwords that change every other day. That's not the society we want to live in, so let's not create that society. 
Um, and blockchain can help automate a lot of these things, make passwords disappear. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about blockchains. A combination of phones with hardware keys in it uh, is you no longer need a password. Any system that's using a password is doing it wrong, in my opinion. Uh, because passwords, you forget, they, they change often, uh, they can be forged. All right. So let's show you an example of, uh, I, I use this example a lot. Um, a tweet comes out from uh, an executive, that's a, I won't name, uh, and it, it violates some SEC regulation, right? Stock prices go up or down. People make or, or lose uh, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars because of that tweet. People might end up in jail for that tweet. We have no idea who actually said it, right? Did the, did the CEO really say that? Or did someone inside Twitter mo modify the database to make it look like he said that? Or did some hacker from the outside corrupt the database? It's Twitter saying he did versus the, the person saying, no, I didn't say that. And then we get into situations where like, you know what, I'm going to say that and then I'm gonna claim I was hacked, <laughs> right? And so people can start to use this uh, well, we don't really know what happened as, as an excuse to escape accountability for their actions. So if websites like Twitter were to build, built on blockchain designed with integrity from the beginning, then there would never be any doubt about who said it. You know, there might be the situation where, all right, someone's holding a gun to your head and making you, you know, put, put your face ID or touch ID and, and sign the, the transaction. But that's an extremely rare circumstance that would have lots of other evidence to go along with it um, and, and lots of other ways to protect uh, and document what happened. You know, you talk about uh, the integrity of our news. They can change history. They change it all the time. Governments change the stats. You know, they release their economic indicators regularly and then Six months later, after no one's looking at the indicator, they revise it to reveal closer to the truth. Or sometimes they revise it the other way. Talk about scientific measurements, where they're trying to generate evidence for or against global warming. How do we know that's, there's any integrity to that? Right? They, they make up the numbers. Uh, we have all kinds of research being done where the source material can be doctored and there's no way of, of knowing it. Or, or authenticating or reproducing a lot of the research. But this gets back into the, the integrity. And I'm start with a question about decentralization and academia versus um, industry. But I, I think the academia needs to study the advanced math and the advanced crypto. And that leaves the groundwork for industry to come along after it's optimized and apply it. And, and they're both they're at different stages in the pipeline of, of research. Yes. Uh, if I were to launch an app today with, say, 10 or 20 million users, is that something that a single chain of EOSIO could support, or do I need to wait for a multi-chain solution? A uh, single chain can support it, particularly if it's a private chain. Um, and depending on how you structure the chain, um, all right, I'll, I'll talk to another aspect of blockchain. It's another distinction that uh, is often lost. People talk about transactions per second. Well, what is, what's in a transaction? If every transaction you're, you're calculating, uh, doing extensive calculations, you're not gonna be able to get very many. But if the only thing you're trying to do is log the order of events, say an election, then uh, you can get much higher throughput. So, you know, these are, uh, I'm going to throw some numbers out here based on internal testing that uh, we've done, but we've seen blockchains based on ESIOs. If you're not running any smart contract code, do over 20,000 transactions per second just ordering the transactions. These are authenticated uh, signed transactions. You make sure that they're properly authenticated and we're doing over 20,000, and that's today on a single chain. You can do a lot with that kind of throughput and we're only going to expand it from that there. Computers are only going to get faster. Uh, and, and that's already fast enough to do visa level. Um, a multi-blockchain world, a single business 
can have many different blockchains and load balance. Right? Facebook or voice doesn't need one blockchain for the entire world. It can have a blockchain per country. Uh, the financial system doesn't need one blockchain for the entire financial system. It's a blockchain per bank. And if the blockchains trust each other, then it's, uh, it's really easy to move money from one blockchain to the other through oracles and, and things like that. So uh, I believe that there's really big businesses, but there's a whole lot of small businesses, medium-sized businesses, that blockchains can easily handle today. And my personal goal for ESIO is to make it the uh, fastest, most general purpose application database out there. So you'd rather use ESIO than MySQL because it's faster. And the reality is ESIO is faster than Postgres. It's faster than MySQL uh, when you're doing the type of, of stuff we're doing. Because um, right now we're processing transactions on the blockchain and then trying to propagate them into traditional databases. And the rest of the infrastructure can't keep up with the blockchain. right? We just need to make the blockchain data, the stuff that we're storing in our smart contracts, more accessible via APIs. And that's, that's what we're working on at block one, is make it so you don't have to compromise. You just go with blockchain because it provides you all the features and capabilities you expect from a current database with all the benefits of blockchain. Yes, Todd. What do you see as some of the challenges in doing uh, election voting on a blockchain? All right. The challenge with elections is they try to cram 320 million votes into a single day. Now, I don't know how many of you pay attention to what's going on with the EOS public network right now, but they're doing 50 million actions a day right now. Uh, and it's, that averages out to about 570 transactions per second. So we already have the capacity to uh, process a US election in one day on an ESIO chain. The, the biggest challenge is not technological when it comes to elections. It's philosophical. It's getting people to accept the idea that it's actually possible to have an election that's secure at the information layer. Uh, and not have to rely on the voting machine manufacturer to tally things. Um, getting people to be comfortable with the idea that they can prove to themselves that their vote was properly cast. Um, and that's the requirement for an honest election. Uh, and getting, now the, the trick there is that, you know, we live in a country with political parties. The political parties can have whatever election system they want in their party. Right? Laws don't apply to that. Uh, so you can have a new political party, and if enough people believed in the, that the integrity of elections uh, was there, then they would, they would actually uh, vote for a party that used blockchain to do its primaries. Uh, doesn't solve the integrity of the final election, but right now it's, you know, you can vote for any candidate as long as uh, they're for big government. Right? They all have the same views uh, on the important stuff. But uh, yeah, I think the technology is not the limit on the elections, and provably on elections, it's all political. Yes. So um, with Facebook and Libra and everything in the news recently, what do you think? You know, well, how do you think Facebook's going to move forward with blockchain, especially in light of you know some things that you're working on with Voice? How do you think Facebook's going to be able to? Well, Facebook's got to solve the scaling problems, too. Uh, and I don't know how they're going to move forward, because I don't know what's going on there. But I do know the impact they've had on the industry. <clears throat> they're causing a lot of people to talk about blockchain and to take it seriously. You know, until Facebook got into it, I don't think they respected Bitcoin or anything as a threat. Libra was the first thing that was perceived as a threat to the dollar. And now all of a sudden you see everyone saying, you know, even Senator Warner, he was saying, we got to keep big tech out of finance. Right? There's a lot of protectionism there. Um, 
and, and worry about losing control over the, over the monetary system. So I don't know which way they're going to go. It's exciting to see that they recognize the value of blockchain. Um, yeah, but once again, the question is, are they going to use it for good purposes with integrity, or are they going to use it to further lock in their control over information uh, and privacy? Uh, and, and that's the, the real concern is they, if they know who all your friends are, they know everything you say, and they know everything you buy. Uh, and, and if you get cut, cut off Facebook, not only do you lose your social connections, you lose your financial connections. There's a lot going on. But I haven't seen Facebook try to address the identity problem. How do we verify these are all unique people? Or the um, integrity of what they're doing with respect to advertising? Or the lack of integrity in manipulating elections and manipulating people's ability to communicate? Right? What, you guys realize we're being manipulated when Google filters our search results and can show us just one side, one view. Right? That, that impacts our view on the world. And that, that gets back to the integrity of big business. Uh, to make sure that the algorithms they're using are transparent so that you know why are you seeing what you're seeing? Um, and is it because there's some blacklist of sites that you're not supposed to see? Uh, is there topics that are uh, inconvenient for the powers that be? Uh, we don't get to see those things today. And so we assume what we see when we go on Google and we go on Facebook is reality as it is, but instead it's reality as they choose to present it to us with their algorithms, without accountability and without integrity. So it's nice to see Facebook looking at blockchain. The uh, question is, is it just a, a money grab, or is it a, an actual change of heart? Um, jury's out on that one. There are some questions over here. I think you had one there. Yeah, go ahead. All right, there's a lot, lot of components to that. I think you said AI and some, some other things? Quantum. quantum, yes, AI and quantum. So quantum computing uh, will eventually change how blockchains have to do signature verification uh, and the technologies we use to do that. Um, I think we're still a ways off before that becomes a practical concern versus a theoretical concern. And blockchains will adapt. There'll be new cryptographic techniques, new signature techniques. But the fundamentals of hashing uh, are still secure against quantum. So you know, blockchains are transactions linked together by the hash to the previous one. So that part of the blockchain will remain secure. And then it's just a matter of upgrading from keys of a certain type to new signature schemes. Uh, the dollar losing its reserve status. That is a huge point of centralization in our society. The dollar uh, allows the federal government to print unlimited amounts of money, fund infinite deficits, uh, and direct all the resources of the economy. And when, when they create new money out of thin air, uh, it doesn't create more chairs, more computers, more steel. It doesn't create more real things. All it does is reallocate those things and make it more complicated to uh, calculate whether or not you have a real profit or loss. We've got lots of people out there who think they're making money every single year, right? You earn interest on your bank account, or right, even if it's like 1%. Uh, you think, hey, I made 1%. The government takes half of it. All right, I made half a percent. But then they inflated 5 10%, <laughs> right? And so it, in, uh, you get less, and your money's going down. So companies are reporting profits, but they're not. They're investing in things that are not sustainable uh, as, as resources are, are redirected. You know, I said earlier, how many people like to get rid of the IRS and having to do that? The IRS creates a very complicated bureaucracy where the government has to know all your financial transactions uh, in terms of you know, did you, when you bought and sell stock, when you buy and sell gold, when you buy and sell crypto. They have to you know, all kinds of employment contracts and business deals are structured around the tax code. But the tax code is only so complicated because we're using the dollar. 
and the dollar has no accountability and no integrity. Uh, you know, it should be in a fair economy that the currency, if it was a, fav a fixed supply, right, let's say we had a blockchain, the currency was an absolutely fixed supply, then the interest rate would be the average productivity of society. Businesses would borrow money, and if they think they can produce things uh, more efficiently than the interest that they're paying, then they'll make a profit. And if they can't, they won't. So that's the average productivity of the best entrepreneurs, right? Every entrepreneur in society is going out there saying, how can I make money? How can I make money? And if they don't have a better idea, if, you know, say, say they have an idea that, oh, I can make a 5% return, but the interest rate is 6%, it's not a good idea. It's not about the absolute 5% return that they can make. It's about relative to all the other entrepreneurs who can go out there and borrow at 6% and make an 8% return. Uh, and so when government comes in and it decides we're going to subsidize loans for this and, and lower interest rates for that, all of a sudden we've, we've got a system where the signals are off. People are investing in things that are not sustainable, right? Where rather than investing in what's most profitable, what increases the total wealth of society with the highest return, right? The only way that you make money is if you have more real things at the end of the day. Uh, now we're investing in things that only make sense in nominal terms. Oh, I got more dollars, but we're so disconnected from the, you know, how many chairs are in the room. Uh, so that's where blockchain can bring integrity to the monetary system. So now let's view a country as a blockchain. Right? A blockchain can be viewed as a country. The, the token can view, be viewed as the currency of the country. And inflation of the token can be used to fund the government. You know, that works as long as there's a fixed limit. If there's a fixed limit on the amount of inflation, let's say the, the federal government was only allowed to increase the money supply by 5% a year. That's less inflation that's going on right now, right? by the way. They're, they're adding $200 billion in the past three months at the Fed right now. Um, that fixed amount of income causes the government to have to prioritize and be subject to market demands uh, for efficiency. They have to make trade-offs. What is the best investment of that fixed budget? It also aligns them with the people. Right? Instead of the government and the people being in conflict with each other, the government wants a strong dollar, and the people want a strong dollar, because the only way for the government to grow in its purchasing power is for the currency to grow. So this is the type of thing where blockchains can provide integrity to things like the dollar and, and national governments, where um, the current system doesn't. Current system banks are just creating money. They don't know where it's all at. They have to estimate the money supply. They don't know how much money there actually is. They can't even agree on the definition of what a dollar is in our society right now. And, and that's a problem. Um, and then we have all these regulations about stable coins. Can you create dollars? Um, you know, are cryptocurrencies backed by dollars? And then you got this middleman of trust. And what happens if they're lying about their reserves? It's the whole fractional reserve. Does the bank really have the gold? Except now it's dollars. And <laughs> do dollars really have purchasing power? <laughs> that's, that's the problem we're in. It makes it difficult for businesses to integrate with the money, right? That was one of the big things. Make the dollar programmable, put the dollar on a blockchain. But that's, that's just an example. So uh, I think to be competitive in the future, the only way a country can actually be competitive if it's got integrity in its markets, if it actually knows that it's making a profit instead of just thinking it's making a profit, right? If you are eating all your seed corn, you can't plant for next year. Right? You might think, oh, there's plenty of corn, but then the future comes and time to pay. Right? So as a society, we're deceiving ourselves into thinking we're productive, to thinking that there's money, to thinking we have real wealth, when in fact we don't. And that that's, results from a lack of integrity in our accounting practices as a government, as a banking system, and so forth. Right, so in the short term, the biggest challenge is making it more uh, easier to develop 
and cost effective so it can be competitive against non-blockchain solutions. In the long term, uh, like all technologies that make things more efficient, it's going to eliminate a lot of jobs for lawyers. <laughs> it, it could eliminate the need for a lot of regulators. And uh, a lot of people kind of just want their jobs. Uh, you know, people are always worried about AI displacing everyone. Well, blockchain can displace a whole bunch of accountants and attorneys, <laughs> and they control our legal system, uh, and they make a lot of money from doing so. So it's going to be uh, a belief that there's something special about an a ink signature versus a digital signature. It's going to be uh, a desire to protect the status quo, to protect vested interests. We could completely eliminate most of the overhead in our insurance industry <laughs> with blockchains. Uh, we could streamline our justice system uh, and minimize the number of disputes in our society. Uh, all these things put a lot of people out of unproductive work, right? Accountants and tax attorneys, they're not doing anything productive. They're necessary overhead for the society that we have uh, and the structure we have. And those people would have to find new work doing new things, and that's where we're going to get a lot of resistance. You know, switching the election system out for one built on integrity and provably secure from an information perspective. A lot of people don't want a system that is secure because their power is based on leveraging the loopholes, leveraging the crony capitalism, uh, the requirement for licenses that are no longer necessary, right? Licenses become a way of excluding competition and protecting rather than being about their original intent of making sure people have integrity, right? So it's, it's the existing power structures that are going to uh, resist this. And that's why it's important to each and every one of us that we choose who we do business with. Are we going to choose to do business with the company that's built on a blockchain? Or are we going to give us our money to the company that offers us something a little cheaper, but it's not on a blockchain? All, right. All of society is in a prisoner's dilemma. Do we sell out to Walmart and give, a, give up our freedom? Or do we buy from the local store, the local producer, the local farmer, uh, and maintain our freedom? Right? It, freedom costs money. Uh, decentralization means redundancies. Redundancies mean lack of efficiencies. Right? Everything would be super efficient if you only had one source of everything, because uh, you know, maximum economy is a scale. But that's counter to decentralization. It's counter to being anti-fragile. It's, um, it's counter to decentralization. So as a society, we have to choose each individual to pay a higher price for a little bit of redundancy in our life, right? Uh, to make sure that we have choices, that we don't have to shop at Walmart because all the other stores have gone out of business. So we don't have to shop at the one grocer in, in town uh, that's only stores beef from the one, uh, one beef operation that can, that can only operate at scale with all the regulations in place because of what government mandates. We have to choose decentralization. We have to choose with that a level of inefficiency and higher prices if we care about freedom, if we care about diversity, uh, and if we care about the resiliency of our society as a whole. What do you think are going to be the impacts of IBC and inoperability, and how do you think are the best ways to achieve those moving forward? Sure. So use some acronyms there. Interblockchain communication, what are the impacts? Well, interblockchain communication is nothing more than interdatabase communication, nothing more than interbusiness communication. Uh, at the end of the day, nothing more than person-to-person -person communication. Um, so the impacts are more streamlined. If a business can verify that you actually do have a degree from Virginia Tech, just by validating a signature, and you don't have to get an envelope that you, that's sealed, mailed directly to them. Uh, you know, we can add a lot of efficiency. So inter-blockchain communication adds efficiency and integrity and prevents fraud uh, in business-to-business -business communication. Uh, and I think it has huge impact. Uh, the other place uh, inter-blockchain communication is used is within one company. Uh, the design we're using for voice has multiple blockchains on the back end. Some of them private for maintaining personal information. Some of them public 
for all the stuff that people get to see. Uh, and that provides security, and there is communication, two-way communication between them. There's already inter-blockchain communication between Ethereum and EOS. It exists today. Um, so people ask this question frequently, and the analogy I'll use is what people, what we have today is the equivalent of dial-up modems. This blockchain can connect to this blockchain because we got a direct connection. What people want is AWS, where you can spawn unlimited number of virtual servers that are all connected to each other at a push of a button and deploy your application across it all and have it all be seamless. That will come in time, but we've got a master modem connections and, and all the intermediary ways of doing uh, you know, spe special case connections to generalize it uh, in the future. And you know, Block One's got some really innovative approaches for making blockchains more general to facilitate allowing one blockchain to communicate to another blockchain. Just throwing a concept out there, each individual person can be viewed as a blockchain. Imagine uh, everyone has a checkbook, and, and you, you sign messages, and you set it different places. There's an order of events in which you've generated things. You're the sole block producer of your own, of your own chain. So if you take that mindset, then EOS is a blockchain that's communicating with tens of thousands of other single-person blockchains. <laughs> How can we then generalize that so that EOS itself can just be viewed as another person from the perspective of other blockchains? Uh, and that's, that's where we're going to get. And right now, it's already possible, but the cryptographic proofs are complicated. The overhead and the complexities of putting it together means it's not easily automated and made accessible, but it's technologically possible. Uh, and there's things we can do to change the, the structure of the blockchain to simplify the proofs uh, and make it more efficient and more accessible. But it's as big of a challenge to have the right mental paradigm for what you're doing as to technically be able to do it. Uh, and that's what we're focused on in block one, is getting the right paradigm so that people can actually think and reason about inter-blockchain communication and reason about what's going on. Because you know, until I probably said that, you probably didn't think of each user as their own blockchain. That's a change in paradigm, a change in perspective that opens up a whole new set of possibilities on what we can do and how we can build and design systems. And that's the level that we're trying to innovate on is, is look at things from a different angle and not just uh, from the perspective that we've been given by the blockchain experts. All right, one more question. All right, in the back. Okay. Make it a good one. Yeah, a quick comment for perspective and then question. So I come from the seafood environment with the Virginia Tech Seafood Center in Hampton. About 150 plus billion dollar a year industry. Probably one of the most com complex food groups that we have. Um, thousands of species, we have capture, we have culture. Um, major consumer misperceptions and misunderstandings tremendous needs for traceability and documentation. Uh, one of my reasons to be here, um, working with groups trying to connect feed inputs and ingredients to value-added feeds that are then shipped around the world, uh, produced in different environments and then processed under different regulations and then brought back in significant uh, fraud issues and potentials. Uh, so the big question, um, we're moving hard into this arena, and I just found out about this conference, and I kind of heard, you know, blockchain good. So came up here to learn, and yes, blockchain very good. Um, so question, we'll be looking in the spring to hire a tenure-track uh, faculty member to work in the nexus of traceability, food safety, food quality, and tying in also social responsible production of the feedstuffs, social responsibility of the worker conditions and all the different, so all of this different types of data along with cold chain and everything to give confidence and control liability. Where do new users such as our program go to find the individuals to evaluate and hire? I know where to go to get the best microbiologists in the world or the best geneticists or the best economics or marketing people, those things I know where to find. How do I 
get something out in the spring, in this example, and approach the population of people that I wish to evaluate to bring into our program to work into this evolving area. You just described the biggest problem we have trying to grow block one. How do you find all the best and brightest people? Uh, the reality is very few people understand blockchain technology um, at a deep enough level to, to build it. We're having to train the vast majority of, of the engineers uh, in blockchain technology. We're still at the, at the cutting edge of, of blockchain technology. And so this is a time for experimentation and, and planning. Find someone with a passion to learn it. There is no one place. In fact, you can take someone who is already an expert in your field, any field, if they have the right passion uh, and the commitment to uh, pursue it in depth, they can become a blockchain expert. They can, become, they can learn the skills they need. And Block One is here to help with that discussion. That's why we're working with Virginia Tech. That's why we're doing this is to help educate more people. Uh, we're building the tools to make it easier to lower the barrier to entry uh, for learning how to build for blockchains so that uh, developers don't have to worry about the, the nuances of it. But yeah, I, I wish I had an answer to where can you go. It's, uh, the, the reality is we have to train and grow and teach, uh, teach people from the ground up. And, and that's what this is all about. So thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.